Hello and welcome to Comics Over Time. This season, which we're calling Murdoch and Marvel, a history of Marvel Comics starring Daredevil, is our most ambitious project yet. Our plan is to look at the state of the comic book industry during a particular year, and then to examine in detail the major ways that Marvel Comics in particular evolved during that year. We'll look at who was creating comics, what new characters or storylines were introduced, and which comics either debuted or ended. After that, we'll get down to business, take out our stack of Daredevil comics, and look at what our old friend, the man without fear, was up to during that same time. We're glad you've joined us. My name is Dwayne, and with me, as always, my good buddy Dan. Dan, how's it going this week? It looks like uh, you're on location. Yeah, I am out working on projects at the lake, so we'll see how this goes. I'm uh, kind of using ad hoc wireless, I guess, uh, basically using a, a connection <laughs> point to MiFi to do this. So I think it's going to be okay, though. Uh, I've been doing this for work a couple of times, and it's worked out fine. Hopefully it will here, too. So nice Sounds to be able good. to get out. And, yeah. How about you? Doing good. Went to the comic book store, picked up uh, some issues of Blood Hunt, uh, the current kind of big Marvel event that is going on, as well as uh, the most recent issue of Moon Knight and looking forward to a new Moon Knight series and the return of Mark Spector. So uh, spoilers alert, I guess, a little bit there if uh, if you had not seen seen the news as of yet. Yep. Looks like the uh, TV show is also kind of getting ramped back up again. Like we might be seeing some live action Moon Knight stuff coming soon too. So those of you who have been with us for a long time know how uh, interested we are in seeing that happen and <laughs> intrigued to see how it's yes. going to work out. Boy, that would be something, Dan, if we got a, a uh, Moon Knight, a second season of Moon Knight and we get a Daredevil Reborn series in the next couple of couple years that would be awesome that would be awesome yeah so so where are we going today dan to tell us what we're talking about oh well have you noticed that every year for about a decade now we've been sort of recounting the impending death of the comic book industry uh sales seemingly slip another 10 percent every year publishers are sort of falling to the wayside every time that we talk about it. It's been kind of depressing for the last few years, really. I'm happy to say that at least for Marvel, this is a year things really start to turn around. It's 1982. The direct market is showing its power and Marvel and others are piling on board this comic shop train and we're getting some really cool stuff because of it. All right. Yes, this is uh Seems like it's going to be a pretty big year, so why don't we jump in and talk about the year in comics. The year in comics. All right, Dan, it's 1982. Things sound like they're actually kind of looking up with regards to Marvel, but what started at the biggest picture? Let's talk about comics in general. Where, where do we start sure. when we think 1982 and the entire comic book industry? Marvel really is the big news in the comic industry in 1982 and, and the like. But the Distinguished Competition has some things going on, too. DC actually added a number of titles. Fury of Storm, which I loved as a kid. Captain Carrot and his zoo crew, which is sort of a, uh, a cartoony Justice League type of thing. Night Force, okay. Swamp Thing, Black Hawk, Aryan Lord of Atlantis. They had a bunch of new books come out. So they're starting to come back after the DC implosion of a few years ago. They're okay. actually starting to grow again. Yep. All right, cool. Which is great. Yes. They're also moving into the direct market a little more. After last year's Madame Xanadu, this year, they come out with their first actual series for the direct market. They call it a maxi series. Instead of three issues or four, it's 12 issues. It's called Camelot 3000. Uh, it was published on high uh, quality paper using offset press and this Baxter paper. That's the, the sort of new expensive paper that a lot of the stuff's going to be printed on in the, in the early eighties. 
This is a series that introduces America to Brian Boland, and it's really kind of an amazing comic book in a lot of ways. It's got some very sort of edgy content for what you'd look at for comics at the time. Uh, it retells sort of the Arthurian story in some interesting ways, and this is a series I loved when I was when I was younger. I thought it was it was really well done. So DC's doing some cool stuff. They're also partnering with people. Uh, there's some comics called Atari Force comics that ended up being bundled into Atari 2600 game cartridges. Oh, really? So if you bought Defender, yeah, if you bought Defender, Berserk, Star Raiders, Phoenix, or Galaxian, you would get a DC Atari Force comic uh, drawn by Jose Garcia Lopez, um, who's just a fantastic artist. This would eventually return as a an actual comic. Um, but for now, they were actually one of those things where they were kind of a, a special size, like a smaller size book. And you sure. can only get them by buying the, uh, buying the games. Ah, huh. that's, that's actually kind of ingenious. I, I think that would, uh, yeah. expose, that's pretty cool. uh, expose people. I think that might be kind of predisposed to cross over from from video games into comic books and and that sort of thing i i i think that's a fabulous idea yeah it's also frustrating because oh i sure you know, having to buy a 20 30 dollar game or whatever to get a comic book was little but i i got a couple of them from friends who got the games and didn't necessarily want the comics and then a couple of them uh star raiders berserk i remember buying myself and getting them um, outside of that Pacific uh, actually grew. They continued on from last year. They added Star Slayer, Ms. Mystic, Twisted Tales, Grew the Wanderer, and Alien Worlds. Uh, a lot of these have really good creators on them. Ms. Mystic has Neil Adams. Star Slayer is Mike Grell. Uh, Grew the Wanderer has Sergio Aragones. And Star Slayer number two actually featured a backup story that was sort of just a throw-in story because they needed somebody to fill pages. A right. guy named Dave Stevens, who'd never made a comic before, was kind of asked, hey, you want to do this? He came up with kind of off the cuff something called The Rocketeer he'd been thinking about, made the oh. story in Star Slayer number two and three, and then that became The Rocketeer, that, and Dave Stevens' legend began. That is that is The Rocketeer then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. He just sort of, That's cool. he just sort of did it did it because somebody needed a few extra pages and he's like hey whatever and and stevens had a really good gig doing other stuff so comics was never really what he wanted to do to make his living mm -hmm. but man was he good at it when he decided to. <laughs> so that that's pretty cool so what else is going on in, in comics around this time if you remember big saber graphic novels from a couple of years ago eclipse brings that back now with don mcgregor as a regular series love and rockets number one by Fanagraphics, um, sort of reprints that that sort of self-printed Ashcan type comic book that the Hernandez brothers did uh, in 1981, and we get the actual launch oh, okay, of yeah. the full Love and Rockets series. Uh, so 1982 is generally considered to be the start of Love and Rockets, even though they did one comic uh, in 1981. Right. Steve Gerber and friends actually published something called Destroyer Duck as a fundraiser for his lawsuit against Marvel to try and get back the rights to Howard the Duck. All sorts of comic creators sort of felt for Gerber and had had it with the way that Marvel and DC handled creator rights and the like, to the extent that not only did lots of people submit additional little stories, um, Gru the Wanderer, in fact, the first Gru is in Destroyer Duck, oh. but the whole main story was actually drawn by Jack Kirby for free oh, wow. just to just essentially because he's like, I hate Marvel too. So yeah, <laughs> let's go ahead and see if we can help you sue them. Yeah. So, so he got a lot of support from his friends and from the people in the industry. He said that that book paid for a substantial part of the costs of his lawsuit against Marvel. Alan Moore's Marvel man uh, appears for the first time in England as long as, as well as V for Denveta, both of them were stories that began in a new comic book called Warrior that debuted this year over in, in Britain. It's going to be a relatively short running series, but very, very influential. Warrior's a, a 
spectacularly important comic book in British and by extension American comic history because of all the guys that worked on that that came over to be important in America as well. Okay. And then in yeah, and then over in Japan, I think it's also important to mention that Katsuhiro Otomo debuts a story in Young Magazine called Akira, which is also going to be important not only to comic book history, but to specifically Marvel comic history. Because in about oh, five or ten years here, Marvel is actually going to serialize and reprint the um, the Akira story in America as one of the first big sort of uh, imports that it, it does from Japanese manga. So... Really? This is the year it started over in Japan. Very, mm-hmm. very interesting. What are we seeing as far as trends within the comic book industry? Uh, there are lots of. It, it seems like it seems like things are kind of on the upswing a little bit with publishers kind of yep. growing a little bit, that sort of thing. I would uh, agree for the most part. I think that the main thing is that if you're a more traditional publisher, it's maybe still tough times. Publishers like Warren, uh, Charlton Comics, Harvey Comics, Spire, Christian Comics, they all depended on the newsstand. Okay. And all of them essentially folded in 1982. Oh. So we lost those four companies. Okay. Um, Charlton essentially didn't actually fold. They just, again, stopped publishing new material. Mm-hmm. So they kind of are hanging on by a thread, but really there's there's not much left of them. And Warren, Harvey, and Spire all just, just closed their doors. But we got new publishers through the direct market. We've got Comico, which did the Comico Primer, which debuted Matt Wagner's Grendel, which was going to be a, a big book uh, in the early 80s. Vortex Comics, with the Vortex Anthology, came out. And First Comics formed, although they don't actually have any books yet. But they made all their announcements and everything. So everybody knew in 1982 that First Comics was coming, oh. even though they didn't have anything out. So it's all stuff we that's also had some come out like in the next year or so? Yep kind of thing next year we'll start well next year we'll start seeing books from first yep gotcha uh we also had some changes in the distributors projects the company that actually put in the lawsuit against uh marvel and dc for for sort of unfair business practices and their distribution actually folded oh. and steve Geppi purchased that company and sort of took the company's carcass you know the distributing warehouses that sort of thing and founds a new company he calls diamond comic distributors oh and this is going to be huge i've heard of diamond comic distributors actually you you probably you probably have (laughs) yes so for a long time they were the only way you could get direct market comic books they they became essentially another really sort of uh you know not not just that they became essentially a monopoly in terms of distribution uh, for comic book stores uh, in, in the last 15 or 20 years. But that has now been broken up. And I think it's always interesting that uh, you always hate something until it's gone. And then suddenly I think a lot of stores are also now going, it's not that easy to deal with four or five distributors either. So sure. uh, it's uh, there's good and bad, but yeah, it's been a huge part of the industry. And then more locally, as a Minnesota kid, I believe this is the first year of the Minneapolis Comic Con in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh. Uh, looks like 1982, they had C.C. Beck, Joe Statton, Chris Claremont, Dennis Kitchen, Kat Yerwande. Uh, so, kind of a, uh, an, a good year to start out. I didn't make it to the Minneapolis Comic Con for a couple of years, uh, so I, I was not at that one. But uh, I did make it to one or two of them sometime in the 80s, so... Be Good cool. stuff. It, it, it definitely then when you have I think something like that 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 ends up starting it really does sort of kind of put it on the map in that area right yes absolutely being like in the middle of the country like like Minneapolis is I mean before that you probably would have had to go to Chicago or or someplace even further I suppose yeah absolutely Chicago or Denver, probably. Yeah. So, yep. So last week we talked about some some creators that uh, that ended up leaving uh, a bit too soon. Uh, I looks like you have a note about somebody this year again. 
Yeah, and this is a more, not not a, you know, kind of an expected someone who's old and in ill health type of, of a tragedy. This was a, a gone way too soon type of thing. Gene Day, actually, he was a Canadian comics artist who'd been working, he started doing, he did some Star Wars stuff. He'd been working on Master of Kung Fu with Doug Mensch and was doing just fantastic work. I mean, Gene Day is a genius artist. And he actually died of a coronary while just sort of out walking around. Uh, he was 30 years old. And he died on September 23rd wow. of 1982. So this was a real shock in the industry. Yeah. Because he was somebody who, you know, was at literally the prime of his, his life and career. And then he was just gone. And so that was, that was a tough one. We'll talk more about this and how it kind of led to Doug Mensch leaving Marvel when we get to the Marvel section. Okay. So stick around for that too. Yeah. yeah. So last week you mentioned that there were no Eagle Awards, but I think they, I think they came back this year, correct? Surprise. They're back. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. They just took a year off. But, uh, and, and really they pretty much this year, if you're not a daredevil or X-Men fan, you could just as well take the year off from these awards too. Cause sure. pretty much Frank Miller gets favorite writer and penciler, Terry Austin, favorite inker, favorite comic books are daredevil and raw, which tied raw was the, uh, the book that was sort of an, an independent, um, not quite underground book by, by Art Spiegelman. Um, Favorite character, it was Wolverine and Daredevil. Favorite group, X-Men. Favorite villain, Darkseid, who actually appeared in the Great Darkness Saga with the Legion of Superheroes and was in an X-Men Teen Titans crossover this year. Best supporting character, Elektra. Best single or continued story was Wolverine number one through four, which was a miniseries that was written by Claremont and drawn by Frank Miller. And favorite new comic was Camelot 3000. Yeah, there's a there's a I lot of Daredevil. Great choices, by the way. Yeah, there's there's a lot of yep. Daredevil representation here, and and obviously X Men. Absolutely, yep. And then just because we're now we're now into the age where I actually was reading stuff, so I want to add a little note for what was my favorite from what I can remember, the thing that I loved most when I was reading back then. Oh. And I know that in 1982, my favorite story, the thing that I loved most from that year, was the Great Darkness Saga that ran in Legion of Superheroes number 290 to 294 by Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen. It's an absolutely fantastic story about sort of how Darkseid returns in the far future to take on the Legion of Superheroes and basically the whole galaxy. Uh, still one of my favorite comic storylines ever and very rereadable. It is fantastic. That so. is awesome. I, I love the yes. fact that you are going to be now including this uh, as we move forward, because a lot of times I'm, as we were getting to this point, I'm like, I wonder what some of the things that, that Dan was actually reading around this time would have been. And so I, I love the fact that you're including in, going to start including some of these notes. The Year in Marvel. Excelsior! Okay, Dan, we have a lot going on in comics as a whole, but let's talk about Marvel more specifically. You talked at the Open about how they are they really seem to be doing well. Lay it on us here. Where, yeah. where do we begin when we talk about Mar Marvel in 1982? Well, really, I mean, comics in 1982, in a lot of ways, is Marvel. DC is doing well. A lot of these other companies are coming in. But Marvel is absolutely just the, the you know, the 100-pound gorilla. They've got Daredevil. They've got X-Men. They're just absolutely crushing on all cylinders. Yeah. Uh, sales went up 19% over 1981. So the That's sort of just to lead it off. The most important thing is yeah, sales. that after years and years of, well, it looks like they're doing better and they're getting things sorted out, but sales still s slipped by 10%. They finally actually are getting the numbers to go up, which does really matter when you're a company. Right? Yeah. So, so they're selling better. Uh, they've got 65 or so titles in 1982. 
this is something I'm still tweaking my queries on because the weird thing is that now Marvel is doing two things in 1982. They changed their brand ID, which has messed with my queries, <laughs> and they also are now publishing comics in two places, in the direct market stream and the uh, and the newsstand. And technically, those are different IDs. And in oh. fact, when you talk to collectors, there are some collectors who only collect like Marvel comics that have the newsstand UPC code on them and some who only collect the ones that have the direct market little little picture of a character in them. Okay. And so they are actually different comic books in terms of how the database looks at them. Really? So sorting out that, I believe I got about 65 titles. I will work on keeping this more more tight as I go along. Among those, we've got Marvel Fanfare, which is Marvel's first direct market series, much like DC brought out um, uh, Camelot 3000. Marvel brings out Marvel Fanfare. It is not, however, a maxi series or a limited series of any sort. It's just coming out as a full on series. It's a dollar twenty-five a copy when everything else is still like fifty or sixty cents. So it's more expensive by far. It's printed on that offset Baxter paper. It looks spectacular, and what they do is they have each issue a couple of stories that are sort of done by various writers and, and artists that are sort of outside of the normal storylines. So you get stories like Black Widow stories or Kazar stories or whatever that didn't really fit in any of the regular books, oh. but were in many cases fantastic stories. Sure. So this went on for quite a while. It was good success. They also debuted their Marvel graphic novel line. Uh, it debuted with The Death of Captain Marvel by Jim Starlin. This thing sold out eight print runs total. Wow. Uh, ending up selling over 200,000 copies, which considering it was like four ninety five or something like that, was just a massive astonishment. Yeah, them, yeah. Right? Bet. Because it's, uh, they sell twice as many of these as they sell a regular comic at seven or eight times the price of what a regular comic is, it's going to make you some money. Yeah. Other graphic novels then followed, and in the end we had either four or five of them in 1982. Michael Moorcock's Elric the Dreaming City, Dreadstar, uh, again by Jim Starlin, The New Mutants, which was the first appearance of Marvel's new sort of mutant super team that was going to be essentially a new younger group of mutants that will study at Charles Xavier's uh, school, while the the newer X Men have all gotten old, or the old X Men have all gotten older and are now sort of out of the uh, the school days environment. Sure. And then the fifth one, which can be argued by the way, okay, is God X Men God Love Men Kills. Technically, this book was published in November of. 1982 it doesn't have a cover date so because of that it doesn't actually have a um it doesn't have like a january or february 1983 cover date but it would have been a 1983 book if they'd have put it in that same three months ahead type of thing uh -huh. so some people include it as a 1983 comic some include it as a 1982 it came up on my query as a 1982 so i'm just going with the comics.org tells me what this does tell you is that two or three of the best stories that marvel came out with in years happened in this first run of marvel graphic novels because death of captain marvel is an absolutely a phenomenal story that's just this sort of quiet elegic story about essentially captain marvel getting cancer and dying and everyone gathering around to sort of pay their last respects to him and the like. And there's some action and the like in it as well. And some, some flashbacks and the like, but it's really not a traditional superhero story in a lot of ways. But I mean, as you can tell by the, the fact it needed eight reprints, it <laughs> resonated with people, It definitely right? resonated. Yeah. Yeah. You know? um, and then God loves man kills is probably one of, the most influential X-Men stories ever. It is a, a story that just directly 
takes sort of the the subtext of the X-Men for all the years of, you know, being against prejudice and and sort of people who are on the outside and like and it just turns it directly into text. And you've got I, I actually brought these with me so I can reread them after after talking about it. Like, Man, I've got to reread uh, God Love Man Kills again. Um but spectacular stories and a really great start to the the graphic novel line, which is going to continue now for years. Um, maybe not quite at this pace, but it's going to continue on. They also form the Epic Comics line. And that starts with Jim Starlin's Dreadstar comic, which follows on the heels of the graphic novel that came out earlier in the year. Oh, so this is new okay. line edited. Yeah, new line edited by Archie Goodwin, which is going to sort of allow creators to publish with Marvel Comics while retaining their copyrights and creator rights and everything like that to the, the characters and material. Oh. And so it's interesting because some people talk about how there's a lot of, a lot of creators who were burned by Jim Shooter and angry at him and didn't want to work with Jim Shooter, but they really liked Archie Goodwin. And so <laughs> essentially he was the buffer that went and, talked to these folks and was able to get deals done to bring people back into work with Epic who had never worked with Jim Shooter and they yeah. kind of done with, with him. So very interesting. Yeah. Also, I guess just as a note, Daredevil did have some things going on this year. He did. Definitely. I assume you're going to maybe mention some of those, but just as a note, Daredevil was huge this year. Yes. And, so and... that was a big part of 1982 for, for Marvel. When when we get to it, yeah, rightly so. They, he had a really, really good year. Like, as far as just good stories, interesting stories, uh, character yep. development, all that sort of thing. But let's move on. Let's talk about new series then. Well, what uh, what debuted in 1982 for for Marvel? A lot of a lot of limited series and a lot of licensed series really kind of let it off. We had a one shot with DC, which was Marvel and DC present the Uncanny X Men and New Teen Titans. That's the one where they faced off against Darkseid and Deathstroke. Uh, we had a Contest of Champions mini series, which actually was supposed to be published a couple of years previous as a an Olympic tie in, and then when the U.S kind of had the whole problem where we boycotted the Olympics in Russia. They canceled that and then reused the pages for Contest of Champions, which was sort of a, a thing that pitted Marvel heroes against each other in various feats. Oh. We had Vision, Vision and the Scarlet Witch miniseries. It was a four-issue uh, series. Important thing in that is that was the series where it was finally revealed that Magneto was Scarlet Witch's dad. Oh. Which previously had been suspected by various people but this was the one that actually made it sort of canon okay. we had hercules prince of power by bob layton which was just a fantastically funny goofy story but it was it was beautiful and a lot of fun i really enjoyed that one and then we had call the conqueror which was a sort of slightly more old skewing um higher higher priced better format book that was another take on sort of a Conan type of character. Okay. And Call was Call was a little bit more relaxed and less bloodthirsty than Conan, <laughs> but uh, kind of existed in the same world. Sure. So, outside of that, a lot of licensed stuff. Like I said, we get GI Joe, which starts out. What's interesting is that GI Joe existed as a comic specifically because. There was a new line of G.I. Joe toys coming out. Okay. And the comic or the, the company Hasbro wanted to advertise their toys, but they weren't allowed to advertise the toys by using a by by doing the commercials for the actual toys as part of a series. So what they did instead is they partnered with Marvel to make a comic book. And then they used the commercials for the comic book to as a back-end way to advertise the toys and 
sort of of be able to get around some of those regulations. Really? It's kind of a weird thing. Yeah. The other thing is, initially, GI Joe was not a success at all. Nobody really wanted to buy it. And then about two years in, it became a massive hit with a lot of kids and in the other market, and the prices skyrocketed. And I remember that G.I. Joe was one of my best-selling books uh, back in the day. So, because I used to sell at flea markets, and G.I. Joe's went like hotcakes. Oh, really? So, yep. Yeah, huh. yeah. And then other than that, Blade Runner, Time Bandits, Conan the Barbarian were all movie adaptations. Uh, the Smurfs was a TV show adaptation. And Team sure. America was another another kind of toy adaptation that was absolutely terrible. <laughs> so they were still doing a lot of licensed stuff. They were doing a lot of miniseries. There weren't actually many new full series that came out that year. Hmm. Kind of crazy. Yeah, that is that is weird. Yeah. All right. So new characters. Did we have much in the way of new characters that uh, were debuted during this year? So. I'm going to do just the, the big ones, but the, there were a few very important ones. We got Cloak and Dagger in Spider-Man, okay. uh, who are a couple of runaways who are experimented on and end up gaining powers and then use those to sort of get back at the, the people who abuse them and then also protect other kids. Uh, I always really like Cloak and Dagger. They appeared here. They don't get their own series until they get a mini series like next year that I really liked with, with Rick Leonardi. But Good characters. They've been around ever since and have been um, very, very prominent in a lot of Marvel stories. Yeah. You've got the new you got the new mutants who are going to be a big part of the X universe. Uh, Cannonball, Danielle Moonstar, Sunspot, and Wolfsbane all debut in the New Mutants graphic novel. Again, they won't get their own series until next year, but they're going to be around a long time. Uh, we also get one other big hero, Monica Rambeau, who is the new Captain Marvel, eventually becomes Photon, etc. Um, I find it interesting how this was not really a big thing back in 82, but the idea that Marvel would have given one of its major old white legacy characters, who is a guy, Cancer, and killed him off, and then later in the year introduced a new character by that name that was a black woman, would have probably made people's heads explode now. But yeah. we didn't really, we didn't really worry about it then. I, it is weird though. I did not realize that the new Captain Marvel came in that quickly. I thought it was a couple of years after hmm. before they uh, before they brought in a new one. So, um, so she was she was Captain Marvel before Ms. Marvel took on the. The title, of course. At this point, um, Carol Danvers would either, I think she'd probably be binary at this point. So Achy. she'll make her way. She won't be Captain Marvel until the 2010s or something like that. Ah, and okay. then as far as bad guys, we had Obadiah Stane and William Stryker. And we had Yukio in the Wolverine miniseries, who's a love interest for Wolverine. Oh, okay. What about what about uh, books coming to an end this year? Did was there was obviously you were talking about a lot of one shots and and like mini series, yep. so obviously those didn't didn't go on. Yep. But were there any main books that uh, came to an end? Two, we lost Savage She Hulk after twenty five issues, which is a pretty good run. Yeah, and we lost Star Trek after eighteen issues, which was far too many. So, there <laughs> yes, you go. we we talked about Star Trek last week. It didn't end up being quite what Marvel had in mind when they originally was, signed up for that title. It was a it was a bad series. Yeah. There have been good Star Trek series and bad Star Trek series. This would be a bad one. All right, so let's transition. Let's talk about who what the bullpen looks like at this point. Uh, obviously, so it's Jim Shooter is still the editor in chief. Yep. And, and what are what are what are we looking at as far as like uh, total people getting credits and and any other big things I guess as far as like who's creating uh, these stories for them this year? Sure, looks like we had a little over two hundred people who were credited this year, and again, so many so many books coming out, miniseries, graphic novels, other stuff, etc. 
Uh, so that's not really that that surprising. There just was a lot of stuff they're doing and expanding. Jim Shooter still is the editor in chief. Uh, Marvel has moved into a different office. They're still in New York, but they moved kind of down the street okay. to new offices this year. Um, so changed out the bullpen a little bit. Shooter also starts this year to promote the names of some of his editors and his staff. And I don't know exactly why, but it seems like, and I think some people have said that he has so much trouble with star creators that he may actually be starting to try and almost like prop up the names of some of his editors and other staff just to try and, and give that continuity of the people who are less likely to leave and go to DC. Oh, but goodness. In any case, uh, it's not a bad thing no. because it's cool that the editors get a little bit more more credit because they were doing good stuff. But it is still a little weird. It, it is, uh, yeah. In the in the realm of Jim Shooter, this this continuing reevaluation, we we have <laughs> again Shooter's doing doing good work, making the the company money and getting some cool books made. But we lost another artist or or another creator. Because Doug Mensch, who'd been at Marvel since 1973, left and signed an exclusive contract with DC in 1982. When he was asked about it, he said, I didn't quit Marvel, I quit Jim Shooter. Oh. So he was pretty pretty direct in that terms is, of what exactly he was thinking. That is pretty direct. <laughs> uh, part of this, actually, it turns out, is he was angry because of the way that he perceived Shooter treated Jim, uh, Gene Day and that they didn't get the credit or the the money that that Mensch thought that he deserved having been there. He's like, people are coming in off the street, getting a higher page rate than Gene Day gets and he's been with us for years. Uh, Day even had talked about how essentially he was unable to take any time off because he's like, I just gotta work gotta work, gotta work. And he just worked himself to death. Oh. So it was unfortunate in any case. I don't know that it's fair to blame Jim Shooter for Gene Day's death, but I think that Doug Mensch at least partly did, and yeah. that is part of the reason why he left. Shooter was also accused by Mensch and then also by a number of fan publications of actually trying to kill off some of the characters. So Mensch is like, he tried to make me kill off Shang-Chi and then re bring in instead a new master of Kung Fu so that they can essentially get rid of some of the old continuity. Oh. And I think, you know, when, when you look at the fact that Shang-Chi has been dogged by the fact that originally, you know, he, he's essentially attached to the old Sax Romer novels and everything else. He had a lot of baggage that I can understand why you might want to get rid of him. And really in some ways, what Shooter's doing is something I think DC has, you know, tried to do as well which is to replace those old characters, bring in somebody young so you can start over. Right. Uh, however, the way that it got communicated, the way that things worked out, uh, did not go well for anybody. Shooter denied he was trying to kill off all the characters, and it sounds like most people defended him, that he was just sort of like, I kind of wish we could clean things up a little bit, not we need to murder everybody. <laughs> so nonetheless, uh, he, he got lambasted a little bit. Mm. We also had a problem where Frank Miller actually offered Ronan to Marvel and to Shooter at some point, but he said he wanted to retain the rights and find a way to do that. At that point, Shooter was unwilling to do that and passed, so Miller took it to DC and they said, sure, whatever you want, Mr. <sighs> Miller. And oh, no. so off goes Frank Miller to DC as well. Oh, so, gosh. Don't yeah, don't don't do this. Don't don't do this. That means no. that means the the glory that is Daredevil is going to lose lose their guy here yeah. soon. For a little while, he doesn't go exclusive or anything. He'll be back. We'll yeah. see more of Frank Miller. Okay. Um, and then royalty payments to go again on the the good side of what Marvel is doing for creators. Their new royalty system actually worked to the tune of over two million dollars. Uh, for works published in 1982. So Marvel gave out over $2 million in bonuses to their creators uh, under the new royalty system, making a substantial, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
addition to the salaries of a lot of the staff. Yeah. So Shooter was correct as well that, you know, Marvel outsells everybody. So it does make sense to, uh, the, the royalties they're doing do make a difference. Yeah. So no, that that's definitely good. It's just, you know, some of the other stuff. Yep. <laughs> All yeah, right. There's, there's problems. Yeah. All right. So what about like the top creators and stuff across this year? What is, what is the, uh, what does the database show you for, with that? A lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, sort of people who are continuing on i'm gonna go with just top three creators we got writer bill mantlow doug mensch and jam demadius we'll be losing mensch of course penciler sal basema john ramada jr and al milgram a bunch of guys who are very dependable artists uh, anchors we've got milgram mike esposito and joe rubenstein colorists bob sharon christy Scheel, and george russos uh, letterer we've got joe rosen janice chang and jim novick so a lot of very dependable yeah na- names we've uh, seen in these lists over the last few years yep. just continue to be up there near the top. The fans here. yeah yep all right so i think that brings us to the rookie of the year who are the new people joining marvel this year and uh that are that are presumably going to have a a, a big impact including one that that, that gets our coveted rookie yep. of the year title yeah, there's a bunch of really good creators. Nobody who was like a, you know, a slam dunk. I, I want to mention Elliot Brown, Elliot R. Brown, because he's somebody who worked kind of as an editor and a writer and did some art, did a little bit of everything at Marvel over like a two decade period. He never really was somebody who made a bunch of really, you know, big new characters and that sort of stuff, but really a, a key part of Marvel just sort of getting books out for years. Uh, Alan Zelenik was the creator of Alien Legion. He's also the guy who sort of did the story about Moon Knight's dad dying and being turned into a golem and sort of solidifying Moon Knight's uh, Jewish heritage. So he's somebody who definitely had a big impact on on Moon Knight specifically. We got Ron Friends, who helped to create uh, Spidey's Black Costume. He also co-created Spider-Girl and the New Warriors. So he's a did a did some good stuff. Had a couple artists in Butch Geis and Mark Silvestri who were around for a while. Uh, worked on a bunch of stuff like you know Geis did X Men or uh, excuse me X Factor, Micronauts, New Mutants. Um, didn't really have any defining runs though, where he was on them for a long time. Silvestri did have defining runs on X Men and Wolverine from like 1987 to 92. He's also an Image co-founder. He's one of the guys who moved along with. Uh, Jim Lee and and McFarlane and those guys to phone the Image uh, Comics Group, and now he's actually the CEO of I think Image and Top Cow or something like this. So wow. he's become kind of an executive more. Okay. His art really has has evolved in cool different ways, and I like the guy a lot. Um, he could easily have been the Rookie of the Year, but I'm gonna go with somebody who is just one of my favorite artists. I loved Paul Smith's stuff when I was a kid. I still love Paul Smith's stuff. He did a run on X-Men that was fantastic. He is Doctor Strange, is one of my favorite Doctor Stranges of all time. Uh, And he also did an X-Men Alpha Flight miniseries, which was one of my favorite stories. So he's got maybe not that many comics really in a lot of ways, but the work he did was incredibly strong. And he does have one truly defining thing that he did that everybody says is actually him and, and either his doing or his fault. <laughs> okay. Uh, for, good or, for, for good or ill, Storm's sort of punk rock look is Paul Smith's doing. So huh. evidently they asked him to redefine, uh, redefine Storm's costume uh, while he was getting ready to leave the the X-Men series. And he sent in like five costume redesigns. Plus just to kind of, you know, make people laugh. He sent in one where she had like a Mohawk and a punk rock look and whatever. And he did not expect that to be, picked. <laughs> but they're like, yeah, let's go with let's it. Let's do that. Know? Yes. And he's, he was like, this is a terrible idea, but okay. And so he, he drew it up and he actually made it look fantastic. And that became Storm's look, not just then, but really for decades huh. and completely redefined her from being the 
sort of ethereal princess that she had been to being kind of this badass leader of the X-Men. So that that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I think that's so Paul Smith. That's, that's definitely uh, a, a kind of the uh, final check in the column to get somebody rookie of the year. I think. No. Plus he's just fantastic. You, you read a Paul Smith book. You're going to be happy. All right. So what is this other note that you have here about the Wolverine miniseries? So this would be my Dan's favorite for Marvel for the year. Oh, which is, okay. In 1982, Marvel published a miniseries by Chris Claremont and Frank Miller that took Wolverine and took him out of the X-Men and just gave him his own storyline. And it starts with him out basically just hunting. And he's hunting a bear. And it gives him that line, sort of, I'm the best at what I do, but what I do isn't very nice. And a lot of the initial sort of feel and even some of the storyline of when you first see Wolverine in the X-Men movie comes from that miniseries. Oh, okay. But it's drawn by Frank Miller. It looks... Oh, gosh. Ridiculously edgy. Yeah. It's got a Japanese sort of component to it where uh, Wolverine falls in love with this woman who's the sort of her family is in with the Yakuza in Japan. And he ends up fighting various samurai and everything else. It's just an astonishingly good story. And it's completely different from anything you'd really ever seen Chris Claremont write for, for Wolverine before. Huh. So really good stuff. Is is that 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 series is that series in Marvel Unlimited? I cannot imagine that it would not be in Marvel Unlimited. Okay. What would even be the use of having Marvel Unlimited? <laughs> sure. It doesn't have the sure, Wolverine sure, miniseries. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's so uh, I, I, mean, I have my own copies and my own graphic novel, so I don't sure. need to uh find it there, but I'm sure it's there. And it's well worth reading. It is it is really good. I'm just thinking about in my time after Frank Miller leaves Daredevil, I'm going to need to probably get myself a Frank Miller fix, and this might be the yep. one of the places I oh, can yeah. look. Yep. And it redefines Wolverine in a lot of ways. You know, this opens up the character, opens up his backstory, and really sort of sets him up where previously he was, you know, a popular X Men. But this is the story that makes him the man of the Marvel Universe for, for the next decade. Yeah. He, so Wolverine becomes Wolverine in this, yes. in, in, as part of this story. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. And he, he was already pretty cool. There's some scenes in like the sewers in the X-Men, uh, or, you know, sewers under the Hellfire Club and whatever, where he was doing some pretty badass stuff. But I think that this... This takes it to another level because Frank Miller just could do something with Wolverine that, you know, the, the pretty art of, of Byrne and, and Austin really couldn't. All right. That sounds good. Congratulations to Paul Smith for his rookie of the year. And Dan, again, I love, I love the fact that you're sharing some of your favorites uh, from the year as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I also would like to encourage anybody out there, if you've got favorites of your own for a particular year, send them in. Love to hear what it was that everybody else was enjoying and thinking about as well. So Yes, that is an always ex- fun to hear excellent what, idea. What other folks' favorite comics were. Excellent, excellent idea. All right, Dan, I think we've covered everything outside of uh Daredevil, so maybe we uh, are around Daredevil, I guess, not outside Daredevil. Why don't we jump in and let's talk about The Man Without Fear. The Year in Daredevil. All right, Dwayne. So, finished up with the other stuff. Now we are on to our main man. What uh, What's going on with Daredevil that you want to talk about this year? It is it is a big year for Daredevil. Obviously, we talked about the Eagle Awards, Frank Miller, uh, best character, all that. Daredevil had a huge year in his own book, and it is a full uh, twelve book arc. We're looking at Daredevil number one seventy eight to one eighty nine. 
He had a number of other appearances outside of this. Power Man and Iron Fist, number 77. is in the uh, Defenders, 103 to 106. Marvel Graphic Novel, number one. Fantastic Four, 242. He's in the Contest of Champions that you mentioned, one, one through three. Dazzler, he was in Dazzler, number 21, and Marvel Team-Up, number 123, and also was in two issues of Incredible Hulk, number 277 and 278. That's a lot to cover. We're not going to cover all that because really the bulk of this year is that Frank Miller run that that uh, I think we were, I, I know I was uh, an, anticipating it and we saw it start last year and this year he Frank Miller wrote all year the writing credits across yep. all these books are Frank Miller with the exception of 183 Roger McKenzie has a co-writing credit with Frank Miller on that book but otherwise it is Frank Miller across all of these as far as pencils Frank Miller is on 178 to 184 uh with Klaus Janssen in 181, but then Klaus Janssen takes over in the latter half of the year and pencils 185 to 189. So Frank Miller has his hands all over these books. And to be perfectly frank, you can tell. And to be perfectly frank, it's really awesome. <laughs> okay. The year begins with Kingpin trying to and successfully recruiting Electra. To join his organization so we mentioned last year that that was something he was going to try and do he in fact is successful in doing that and matt murdoch is going and looking into that mayoral candidate Ra randolph cherry because an intern has come forward with evidence showing that cherry is working for wilson fisk meanwhile nelson and murdoch have themselves a new office in a new york high-rise so the bombing of the storefront that we saw at the uh, latter stages of 1981 has caused them to move to an, a high rise in, in 1982. So as we move forward, Electra then encourages, I use quote fingers with that, Daredevil and Ben Yurick to drop this whole Cherry Fisk story that, uh, that, that they are working on kind of together that Yurik is going to actually potentially publish in the Daily Bugle. Uh, Yurik specifically ends up being encouraged with the use of a sigh in the, in the chest. Doesn't kill him, but uh, definitely would cause you to kind of reevaluate your, your life decisions. I'm sure. So uh, yeah. Um, so despite this, though, Yurik and Murdoch, when they're trying to figure out what their next move is, they realize that Vanessa Fisk may still be alive. And they go looking for her. They end up finding and rescuing her from uh, this King of the Sewers character. So there was uh, she was living in the sewers with a whole bunch of other people that were uh, you know, kind of in the sewers because they had nowhere else to go. And there was this this guy that was kind of leading them. And uh, so they end up fighting. They get they get her. They say it, rescue her. And then Daredevil hands Vanessa Fisk are over to Wilson Fisk. And in exchange, Cherry, who has just been elected mayor of New York, is forced to resign the new post. Like, literally, like, Two pages later, so he's like giving a giving a speech about how he's happy to be elected as the new mayor of New York, and then Daredevil and Fisk meet. They uh, exchange Vanessa Fisk, and then he's like, "Oh, I have to resign. It's it, I can't, you know, can't do this." As a result of this, uh, Kingpin then orders Elektra to kill Murdoch's partner Foggy Nelson as payback. Right, so that's kind of the setup for like the first quarter, uh, for first two, three, four books, roughly. Dan, this is this is an incredible start to the year. There is a lot of really interesting stuff, a lot of story building, and 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 everything, and and definitely some payoffs from kind of the end of 1981 
that then kind of get tied up in 1982. What did you think of these books? So I, I mean, they are fantastic and they're especially nice if you look at them in context of, I think for a lot of folks who are used to modern comics, Frank Miller's work here doesn't seem particularly groundbreaking. It just feels kind of comfortable. Yeah. Because this is what we're now used to as comic books. Yes. Right? This definitely when feels you start like looking at them. It definitely feels like the stuff. Ahead. It definitely feels like the stuff I've been reading, like as far as some of the newer stuff and the stuff that I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, Jed McKay and all the yep. stuff that he's been doing. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yep. But if you consider what we've been reading for the last, you know, three, four or five months, and you look at what Daredevil and what Marvel has been in 1965, 1970, 1975, yes. that this is then just different, right? Yes. And it's, it's interesting and it's new and it's exciting. What I like really is how he digs so much into the ethics and so much into the guilt and so much into the question, you know, nobody else had previously ever really dealt with the fact that Matt Murdock was a lawyer who was also a vigilante. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the fact he was a lawyer really became at most a plot point in a lot of ways. You know, it was a way of clients would come in and that would give Daredevil an in for for finding, you know, that he want, he needed to do something. Right. What Miller does in these books is especially with Bullseye, he sets up this situation where you've you've got essentially a character who really starts to make Matt Murdock question what is the purpose of the law? What is justice? You know, is it the right thing to do to save people? Up where everything comes back to that question of what is Matt Murdock supposed to do? And I mean, he picks this up in Dark Knight Returns later, you know, with the whole question of, of Batman and the Joker as well. But there's so much going on here in terms of under the surface moral and ethical stuff that you just didn't really see in a Marvel comic or a DC comic normally. Yeah, I, these these this these stories that that we saw the end of last year into the beginning of this year definitely don't feel like anything that we saw before Frank Miller in in these in in the Daredevil comics themselves. Like we've seen really good art, we've seen some stories that hit, we saw definitely some stories that have missed, but it was the combination of the two and the how they fed off one another that I think is is really interesting. And and to your point. There's complexity here, and I am definitely somebody that I think really enjoys complexity uh, in in story. Not complexity for the sake of complexity, but complexity is in showing people yep. as being complicated because people are complicated, right? People do things mm -hmm. for reasons that other people can't comprehend, and and I love when they are able to kind of show you via word or via image, give you an idea of what was going on in the character's head and why they made those sorts of, uh, so, sorts of decisions. And, and I feel like everything that we saw shows just how complex these characters are that are in these stories, like Daredevil. You could yep. see he, even, even somebody like Foggy Nelson ends up being more complex than he ever was uh, before Frank Miller uh, touched them. Yep. All right. So I'm rolling along these Daredevil books, and then suddenly we get in a big double issue that is narrated by Bullseye. We see that the villain escapes prison, learns Matt Murdock's secret, attacks and kills Elektra, before battling and losing to Daredevil, which puts him in the hospital. Now that is 
an unbelievable yep. sentence that I just read to you. And obviously, we had to pick a feature story for this leak. The spotlight story is, in fact, this one, because I cannot do this story justice in, in, in like one bullet point. So we're going to talk about that story in great detail. But as a result of this, Murdoch has trouble dealing with Electra's death and starts acting out at work and as and as the horned hero himself. And at one point, he even accuses Kingpin of hiding her. He he's convinced that she's alive and and is like being hidden or or kidnapped or abducted or being held hostage by the Kingpin. And he actually goes and confronts Wilson Fisk about it. Dan, to your point. These two stories are just, they're, they're unreal. And what, what did you think specifically about kind of the aftermath of the big double issue? Because we're going to talk about the big double issue as our spotlight story. Well, I think that what I love about it is just that you see him essentially unable to just move on. You know, that this is somebody who is sort of actually experiencing the kind of after effects you would expect right. shock and lack of lack of ability to understand or or accept what's going on it's kind of those stages of grief being acted out you know and it is also interesting because you you see the fact that he has not only um He's he's not only lost Electra, but he also just about killed somebody as well. Yes, you know, and the fact that the fact that Bullseye alive is really more of an accident than an intent because yeah. he didn't you know he didn't push him out to break his neck. He pushed him out to kill him pretty much. Yeah, and so I think he's dealing with a lot of things right now, and that's kind of the the whole point of it. You know, this is a guy who's just having everything taken away from him and he just can't, he can't deal. Right. So next up, there's a young girl on drugs, takes a dive out of a school window and ends up dying. And her brother, Daredevil and the Punisher are all trying to tack, track down the dealer responsible. Along with that, we have... Matt Murdock proposing to Heather Glenn. And uh, yeah, in, in a really kind of weird and off-putting sort of way, actually. It, it, it's really quite, quite strange. You know, he's was just the previous issue having so much trouble dealing with Electra and now is proposing to another woman. It definitely feels like something's not right there. And and even in this story, we have Daredevil and the Punisher getting into a fight over how to bring the dealer to justice. Uh, the Punisher wants to basically kill him. Daredevil wants him to go get arrested and be, you know, tried because he's a lawyer, remember, and, and thinks, you know, believes in the justice system and all this. Again, another really interesting story that that follows up uh, what's going on. But But you have a note in here that this is actually... This story actually was supposed to occur sooner than than this point in in uh, the Daredevil kind of timeline. Yeah, there's actually an interview that I listened to where Klaus uh, Jansen and Frank Miller were talking about this issue, and evidently they it was something that they'd worked on with Roger McKenzie, and that's why McKenzie actually has a co-reading credit on the first issue of this two two book series and it was evidently pulled because you know this is a a story about a young girl dying of a drug overdose and a, another like a her brother who's another young kid going and grabbing a gun and deciding to take vengeance on you know, the person who he th thought was responsible himself it was it was not a it was no. not a a you know sweet little story and so it actually was pulled initially from the the series due to concerns that it wouldn't make it through the code. And then afterwards, uh, Frank Miller reworked it. But they said that also, this was actually kind of a significant problem for them because when they did the 
uh, when they did this story originally, they had the first issue about ready or planned out, and Shooter told them, no, we can't do this. And they had to essentially write and draw and get ready an entire new issue in something like two or three weeks at just kind of cr crazy speed because he's like, we're going to run a reprint or a, you know, a fill in and, and Miller did not want a fill in on his run. Right. So I'm not sure which one it was, but there was one series or one story back, uh, probably about 10 issues ago. That was one they really had to hurry to get out because otherwise they would have had a fill in because of this. And so they took that original story and reworked it as this two-part story. Uh, and you know, this again, Frank Miller and the Punisher was something that really gave the Punisher an, an additional uh, sort of bit of of exposure. And this is kind of when the Punisher really starts to get uh, kind of a little bit of that that edge that defines him for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the decade. So. Yeah, I, yeah. It's... But I do think it is interesting, though, that that's the the thing that Miller talks about is one of the defining things about Daredevil is he is that guy who, at a fundamental level, does not believe that it's that one person has the right to take justice into their own hands. So Daredevil becomes kind of like this facilitator of justice but he can't be final justice yeah. his job is to get people to the justice system and then to whether he's a lawyer or whether he's daredevil to accept the outcome of whatever you know the trial or the judicial system uh decides whereas the punisher has no time for that he's just you know a, a law unto himself right uh to your point, the issue 184 has Daredevil pointing a gun, like at like the reader, basically pointing it out out of the of the comic, and it has a a note, no more Mister Nice Guy, which is actually a reference to the uh, 1972 Alice Cooper song, and in that issue, he ends up actually shooting the Punisher with his own gun just to ensure that. Uh, this drug dealer ends up getting arrested as opposed to being shot and killed by the Punisher. That That's how, how important it was. He was going to make sure that, that this guy got justice and not, not the Punisher's brand of justice, I guess. So next up, we have Foggy beginning to investigate why Heather's, Heather Glenn's company is making bombs, and this causes him to run up against both Eric Slaughter and the Kingpin. There, Daredevil ends up caught in an explosion, uh, in part kind of to trying to save Nelson, I believe. And that ends up messing up his radar sense again. So that's... See, see he, he's had a few issues with his ra radar sense recently. And, uh, yes. And, and he has, has it happen again here. But that doesn't stop Murdoch from gathering evidence to take down Glenn Industries, even as his other senses go haywire. Meanwhile, he's also pressuring Heather to accept that marriage proposal that that uh, we mentioned a little earlier ago. So he's like, actually, it, it's weird. He's kind of like taking down these bad elements in Glenn Industries that, you know, Heather Glenn is now kind of the chairman of the board on because of her father's passing. And he's like kind of working to take her company down and then she's looking at it like and you want to marry me because i don't really have anything else to do it was there was th this whole kind of side story with and and with heather where heather glenn is has really kind of taken a turn i think this year and it's it's really kind of weird i think be perfectly frank. Well, it's weird, but actually, I, I think the interesting thing is that Frank Miller kind of sees Matt Murdock for who he is, right? That this is a guy who his, you know, last 150 some issues, he keeps going out with women and being in love. And then as soon as he happens to actually, you know, get one of them and he's got a girlfriend or, or they're interested, then somehow he finds some reason to break it up. Yeah. And he is constantly just essentially a, a terrible, <laughs> terrible, uh, sort of romantic partner. Yes. But, 
this just amps it up now with with Electragon and all the rest. He's got this weird rebound proposal. He becomes very clingy, and he also sort of is like attempting to basically tell her, you know, you just need to give up your company and sign it over and let the men take care of it and then come home and and just be my little wife. And he really is just toxic as hell this dude. I mean, he's yeah. he is not he's not having a good moment right now and it's it's just seeping over into all of all aspects of his life. Yeah. But he is even worse than normal in terms of the way that he treats his uh, his girlfriend. And when you look at how he's treated Black Widow and how he's, you know, treated all of these other uh, girlfriends over the years, that is saying something. Yes, it is. All right. So we have, we have Daredevil without really his radar sense and his other senses are not really able to, uh, to compensate. So they're getting worse. Things are getting worse and worse as far as Daredevil to try and do his, you know, bring people to justice business. So he ste- seeks out Stick uh, for help. Stick is somebody that he's worked with in the past that helped him kind of hone the radar sense. And and he's hoping that he's going to be able to, to get that figured out. So while this is going on, we have the Black Widow is trying to deal with the hand and, and everything that they're trying to do. And she ends up getting poisoned. There is a ninja villain that we talked about last week, the Kiraji, that has been reanimated yep. and his body is made whole. Yeah, he's like this this super he's essentially a super ninja who's been yes. around theoretically for hundreds of years. Yes. And the hand have a way where by taking four of their warriors and having them sacrifice their lives, those people's soul can be gone, gone back in and reanimate someone. And so they reanimate Kuroji that way to bring him back so that they can get their super, their super assassin back after he dies. So. So Black Widow is poisoned. Uh by and being kind of stalked by the uh by the kiraji and um is desperately trying to find daredevil to get help and meanwhile matt murdoch at slash daredevil is recovering his hyper senses in an isolation chamber under the watchful eye of stick and his uh ninja sidekick stone so he's not really able to, should, it, it's, he's not really able, he's not there. Like he's always not there when, when it seems like uh, when Black Widow needs him, he, he just tends to not be there for her. And the year ends with Black Widow dying to the poison, but then being resurrected by Stone, which is Stick's right hand man. Daredevil and company then have a free-for-all with the hand in which Stick gives up his own life to save Matt Murdock. Widow and Foggy break up the engagement of Heather and Matt using some handwritten notes. And Stone tells, tells Daredevil that the hand are planning on resurrecting Elektra like they did the Karaji. So this is really, really kind of escalated story here over the last few issues of the year and you think about the gut punch that happens in mid-year with or earlier in the year with Electra dying hearing that Electra could potentially be resurrected and become basically uh enslaved to the hand as a result of this resurrection process uh this this was this was a crazy end of the year and definitely had me excited in to continue reading on to find out what was going to happen because oh my goodness i couldn't yep. even imagine where this story was going to go next <laughs> yeah it's kind of nuts it is kind of nuts you, you have a note in here about uh about daredevil's sales during this year why don't you share that yeah well 
what should not surprise us is, although sometimes it does, making better comics has not always caused sales to go up. But in fact, Daredevil sales went from 130,000 up to 180,000 in 1982 making it not only one of the better-selling Marvel titles, but also essentially like a 50% increase in sales over the previous year. So people were noticing what Frank Miller was doing, and they were, they were sort of, you know, talking with, their, talking with their wallets and actually buying up more copies. So Marvel was, Marvel was very happy. This was another great year. Of, of Daredevil comics. No no question about it. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you look at this, 1982, with with having the death of Elektra and having kind of his, you know, his first big fight with Bullseye, where, where that and everything, you've got, you've got that Punisher two-issue series. There are probably a few years in Daredevil history that can approach it, but I think there are a lot of people who, if you ask them, What's the best year of Daredevil comics ever? 1982 would probably hit quite a few lists as number one. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. So sorry, it's all downhill from here, Dwayne. So. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Well, it was a good run, Dan. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Still some pretty good stuff. Yes. There's still some pretty good stuff. I I, ima- I imagine there is. They they've got some stiff competition from from what we've read this year, but uh, but but yes. So let's talk about the news this year. So there wasn't really any new powers or toys or places. Everything really happened in in New York. Uh, familiar things, I guess. The only new thing was the new offices for nelson and murdoch in the high rise but we knew that was going to happen so so that was really the the main thing as far as new supporting characters we saw this sheldon character who was the intern that had the the dirt on randolph cherry we saw the heroes for hire which was luke cage also known as power man in here and danny rand as iron fist they're actually hired by Foggy to be Matt's bodyguards when when uh, Foggy was concerned that that mm-hmm. Matt Matt might actually be in some form of danger. Little did he know. Uh, we have the yep. we have the Punisher who ends up talking to Bullseye when he's in prison, and then um, you know helps bring uh, or is trying to help bring a drug dealer to justice a little bit later on in the year. We have Mr. Spindle, who is doing shady work for the Glenn Injuries without Heather's knowledge. He's one of those people that uh, that Daredevil is trying to bring down as part of the, uh, the 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 bad element working at Glenn Industries. That also has the side benefit of potentially causing Heather Glenn to accept the marriage proposal. And then we have Stone, who is Stick's uh, Stick, the ninja, his his sidekick. And ends up, you know, resurrecting Black Widow at the end of the year and is working with Black Widow and Daredevil as the year ends as they try and figure out how to deal with the hand. So bunch of, a bunch of interesting characters. As far as new villains, kind of, we had the King of the Sewers, who is a head of, gr- head of a group of disfigured sewer dw- dwellers in New York, who happens to be caring for i guess might be a word to describe uh his relationship with vanessa fisk uh, kind of i i actually think the better way to describe it for folks who maybe uh aren't reading the books is it reminded me of jabba the hut and slave leia okay sure. and in fact it's kind of weird because it comes out the year before return of the jedi but he kind of is like this big fat dude who's sort of got her sitting there in the same sort of position. It looks very, uh, it looks very uh, Jabba the Hutt-ish in, in the comic. So I didn't make that connection, but that actually is a really, really yeah. uh, good way of describing yeah. it. Uh, he was, he was icky. Yeah. And then uh, Peter Hogman Grunter, he is the drug dealer that is involved uh, with the, the little girl's death that uh, Punisher and Daredevil are 
have a disagreement over how to bring to justice. So those were some of the, some of the new characters that we saw this year. Uh, but Dan, the the big thing that we have to talk about is, I think, the spotlight and the death of Electra. This week's spotlight story. Daredevil 181 from April 1982. It's called Last Hand. Tell us a little bit about this story and why it's your spotlight issue. I mean, the, there was, in looking at a year of really good stories, this by far stuck out to me as the one that we had to spotlight. This is a double-sized issue of Daredevil, features a showdown by two of Marvel's greats, Elektra and Bullseye, with a subtitle that reads, One Wins, One Dies. So you knew something big was going to happen here. Double issue, you have an ultimatum basically on the on, on the cover, and I don't know what I was expecting. You know how many times, though, over the course of my comic book life, I've been told this issue someone dies and then no one actually really dies i'm sure uh, it happens a fair amount the truth in advertising is not something comics are known for so in this one frank miller is not messing around with us because one indeed did die yes so I, I respect that so the story begins with bullseye in jail daredevil having put him there uh he's suffering from headaches they're that require the guards to give him pills to stop the pain. So while in jail, he's, he's pushing himself to work out and he's plotting his revenge. And while in the courtyard, he runs into Frank Castle, the Punisher, who's also in jail and says that the Kingpin has replaced Bullseye with another assassin. Soon after, Bullseye is put on television for an interview to talk about all his murders and, and all his nefarious dealings. And while having another headache, a guard tries to give him a pill, which Bullseye promptly spits in the guard's eye, allowing Bullseye to jump free, hold hostages, and eventually escape through a helicopter. So you have this absolutely just crazy start to this this story. And and the thing that I that struck me about this book immediately is this book is narrated by the villain. Dan, this was yep. the most kind of weird. interesting part of this because we are getting kind of the internal monologue as well as of the of, of the villain Bullseye in this, as well as you know all the conversation and everything that is happening, and he is really really angry with Daredevil at the start, and then he gets really really angry with whomever this assassin is that's taken over. His 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 station in the Kingpin organization. So you're like, okay, now we know exactly why these two are squaring off when we saw them on the front cover. Yep. I. Th this is a great start to this story. What where where were you at at the at this point? What did you think of this? And what it were were you as i guess floored by this when you read this story as as i was to this point i remember back in you know the the problem is that i didn't start daredevil until probably 1983 or something i missed the the miller years oh because somebody evidently at the newsstand i went to was smart enough to buy the daredevils before i got there so i just never saw them and so I knew they were out there and they were doing cool things. So I knew Electra had died before I was able to read this. this oh, yeah. year. It's a great way to get things set up. He's put all his chess pieces on the board. And now I think at this point, most people are still expecting that somehow it's not going to go as badly as it's probably going to go. Um, and you're just sort of sitting there, but you do have, an understanding of why all this is happening. You also understand that Bullseye is pretty much just crazy. Yes. You know? So I, it's, it is interesting getting to see things from there. I, I think one of the best things about the fact that we get this narration by Bullseye for this issue is the fact that we realize just how crazy it is. And so, 
you suddenly realize that he is capable of doing just about anything. And if that means killing Daredevil, if that means killing Electra when he finds out who she is, you definitely could see how that could happen. Yep. So while off to find the hired assassin, he runs into some thugs telling him that the assassin Electra is hired to kill Daredevil's lawyer partner, Foggy Nelson. Recognizing that Daredevil could possibly be Matt Murdock, he follows Electra as she hunts for Foggy. Electra then runs into Foggy, and shortly after, Foggy recognizes Electra as Matt Murdock's old girlfriend from college, which we, you know, talked about during that introduction just last last week. But sensing that Bullseye is near, she allows Nelson to escape and waits for Bullseye to show himself. The two then fight across several pages where each gets as much as they give. The fight ends with Bullseye using a playing card to cause Electra to drop her sigh. Bullseye then grabs it and promptly stabs her through the chest. Crawling back to Murdoch's house, Electra dies at his doorway. Dan, I was absolutely devastated by the time I got to this point in the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's been... And it's weird because Elektra has not exactly been set up as a real protagonist. Because she's still the villain. She's an assassin working for the Kingpin, right? Right. But we know enough about her back, backstory and sort of how she got there that there's still sympathy and you know that this is going to affect Matt. And so it really does just hit you like a ton of bricks. So... Yeah, there's a... Yeah, this was... This messed up an awful lot of people in the early 80s. Like, the death of Electro was not something that people just went, oh, well, that's a that's an interesting story development. Yeah. Right? They were ready to burn down Marvel when this happened. So... The was, the act, interesting. The actual the actual panel, there the the two figures are silhouetted, but you see basically the scythes or the scythe sticking out her back, and it is just it is just a an absolutely gut punch of a, of a panel, and it, and it is crazy to me when I think about it because it's like literally I just met this character. Not not like more than about twelve issues ago. Yet I feel that strongly about this character already, and yep. to have have this happen. And you know, I look at I look at this book, and I'm like, that's all we really needed for this story, right? We could you could have ended it there, and they're pro, you know going on and having the aftermath of all this. It it would have been fine, but we actually got more to this story in this issue, which to me is absolutely crazy. So back at D P Kingpin's, Dare Bullseye tells the Kingpin that he's found out that Matt Murdock is Daredevil, that that is his secret identity. And after some convincing, Bullseye is sent off to kill Murdock as a result. Ex Murdoch, Daredevil, expecting an attempt on, on his lawyer's life. Daredevil places a dummy mat in a house, forcing Bullseye to be fooled about Murdoch's real identity. He actually sets up like this fake person at a desk and he records his voice like a, a literal straw man literal sort of thing, straw yes. man with it with like a no. voice he's he did a voice recording and was having it on playback and so when bullseye comes sneaking into the house to try and kill murdoch he sees him at the desk and uh you know he goes in and stabby stabby i'm gonna kill kill him and then all of a sudden daredevil appears behind bullseye and the two battle it out yet again They're fighting, and it ends up kind of getting outside, and Bullseye ends up falling off the building. Daredevil catches Bullseye and listens to him plead for his life. Daredevil thinks otherwise and refuses to let Bullseye kill again, 
dropping him to his death. Everything we knew about Daredevil to that point was he should not have been able to do that. He even saved Bullseye's life last year. And he says, no, I, you've gone and you've killed and you've done things and you killed Elektra. I can't let you do it again. And he drops him. And so this book ends with Murdoch going to Elektra's gravesite to mourn while the final page shows Bullseye in a hospital in a full body cast and he's plotting his revenge against Daredevil. Dan, I, 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 I can't... I, even this recap, it doesn't do this book justice. This was a huge yeah, deal. It's... Even now, to me, this is a huge deal. It is hard to do it justice without the art. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that, that makes a diff- big difference. The other thing, though, that's important about the fact that the art is such a big part of it is who drew it. I think that's something that is is often sort of kind of underappreciated in this is that this was not drawn by Frank Miller, right? Right. Because um, it says, you know, story story and art, Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen finished art and colors. But really, at this point, a lot of the actual finishing of the art and the, the real, you know, the, the, the decisions about the art were being made by Janssen. Miller's doing panels and he is setting a lot of that up and, and, you know, getting the, the breakdowns and the like, but more and more, you know, especially with, because he's busy doing the, the Wolverine miniseries this year, he did not have a ton of time to actually do all of this stuff, you know? So. Yeah. That makes sense. I I hadn't considered that, but it, it just, it's still, it felt so, it's, it looked so good across this entire thing. And yep. yeah, I, I, the other thing about this is obviously Bullseye doesn't die, which obviously, or which means so I, I, go, go ahead. I do want to actually question you, by the way, on the Bullseye dying, because he does say you'll you'll kill no one ever again, but in the panel before, Bullseye has actually still got the sigh, and he's taking it and swinging it up at Daredevil's like face or arm, and he's like, "You won't save me, not like before. Kill you, I'll kill." And then Daredevil says, "You'll kill no one ever again." <laughs> and almost did he. He he intended to save him, and Daredevil. It's it's like Bullseye forced his hand a little bit. I'm. I don't know if. It's explicit that Daredevil actually would have dropped him, if Bullseye didn't, attack him. I don't know, on that. So. Because that, cause that is tough. I mean, Daredevil actually dropping him is, like you said, you know, he survived, but he could have just as easily died. So, yeah. You think you think he dropped him I th- intentionally? I think he, I think he did, yeah. I think that that's how I read it. Maybe I read it incorrectly, no. but that's how. No, I, I think you read it the way a lot of people did and i think you read it the way that miller probably intended but i also think he put enough wiggle room in that if somebody wanted to still believe that daredevil didn't do that that you could say that bullseye was swinging at him and he he dropped him because he was trying to get out of the way but the the caption is pretty damning as far as it goes so I, we we could sit here and we could talk at at length about this book about this book. This is yep. a, an absolutely fantastic book. If you have not read this book, this is definitely worth reading and seeing the art that goes along with this story. Um it is it, it is phenomenal phenomenal work. 
But I think we do actually have to wrap up the episode this week. So why don't we jump in and talk about the takeaway for this week? This week's takeaway. All right, Dan, we've looked at comics as a whole. We've looked at Marvel. We looked at a banger of a year for Daredevil, despite some of the things that actually happens to the character. What is the takeaway for this year? What What is the, the thing that we should remember? If, if we're thinking about 1982, what is the thing that we should remember about this, about this year? I, mean, I think both for, for comics and for Marvel, the takeaway really is that the early returns on the direct market were very promising and that a lot of the things that were happening in comics that really were leading it forward for the next few years, the, the graphic novels and some of the, you know, the direct to comic stores series like Marvel Fanfare and Camelot 3000 were really depending on that idea that there was a built-in market at the comic stores for particular types of books and that more and more the comic industry is going to be depending on that and really that maybe at this time the comic industry needed to depend on that because we were seeing more and more that the the newsstand market had gotten sort of soft and maybe that was something they could have turned around maybe it wasn't but this was definitely an option that that proved to be viable and it's the direction they decided to go. So I think really 1982 is the year that the direct market sort of quote unquote saved comics in the eyes of a number of folks. And it's going to, it's just going to accelerate in terms of the, the dependence on that market from here on out. That's going to put a wrap on this week's show. We'd like to thank you for joining us. If you're new to the podcast, please consider subscribing on your podcast player of choice. That way you'll get each new episode as soon as it's released. If you've already subscribed, we'd appreciate it if you'd share the show via social media or leave us a review. That will help new listeners find the show much easier. Whether you're new to the podcast or you've been with us from the beginning, we'd love to get your thoughts about this week's show. You can send those to us via email at comments at comicsovertime.com or via Twitter or Blue Sky. We're at Comics Overtime there. Until next week, take care, everybody.